Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to open hearing number 12 of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is entitled Shadisalization of Matters of Public Interest Against People Who Exercise Freedom of Expression. Uh, the acronym in English is SLAPS. This hearing is a regional hearing and has been requested by the group of organizations which are here today. Uh, these organizations are Article 19, the Forum of Argentine Journalism, the Brazilian Association of Research Journalism, the Foundation for Freedom of Press of Colombia, El 20 from Colombia, Institute Demos from Guatemala, Colombia Global Freedom of Expression, and the Institute of Press and Society of Peru. My name is Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitinho. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I am also the rapporteur for the rights of children and the rights of indigenous peoples. And today with me are the male commissioners of the commission. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, rapporteur for human rights defenders. Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, who is rapporteur for persons deprived of liberty. I'm not seen Carlos Bernal, who is a rapporteur for persons with disabilities. And also among the male members of the commission that are today with us, we have the special rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Baca. Also today with me are the executive secretary of the commission, Tania Renault, the assistant executive secretary uh, for monitoring, training, and several other matters of the commission, Maria Claudia Pulido, and our team of specialists within the Inter-American Commission. I'd like to start by saying that you know that uh, you've been allocated time limits and since this is a hearing in which there is no state participation so the civil society organizations will have 25 minutes to participate and then the commission will have 25 minutes to participate and then the civil society will have 22 minutes to react and to share their final comments the goal of this hearing is as follows, and I would like to make a personal comment. I have always been committed to this issue with the support of the special uh, rapporteur for freedom of expression. Um, today we are here to address uh, the implications of these lawsuits by officials and politicians and business persons. These lawsuits are aimed at intimidating critical voices. And SLAPS um, was a new term for me and it was a term coined by UNESCO and this is what SLAPs are, a strategic lawsuits against public participation. And this matter is about the judicialization of critical voices or opposing voices within the community. So having made this short, introduction. It is an honor for me 
to listen to a group of organizations. We are well aware of your expertise, your work and your commitment to freedom of expression and to the mechanisms that we have at our disposal to guarantee this right. So I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the civil society. I would like to ask you to indicate the organization that is taking the floor. You have organized uh, the distribution of time, the allocation of time, but please for the record, we need the names of your organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Esmeralda. And I also would like to greet the commissioners and the special rapporteur. My name is Paulina Gutierrez. I'm here on behalf of Article 19. I would like to thank the commission for granting this hearing. This is the first time that the commission will talk about this issue that is SLAPS, strategic lawsuits against public participation. These lawsuits are a global phenomenon. They imply the abusive judicialization. And Latin America is a complicated territory. And sometimes these lawsuits um, are not considered or are not noticed. But there is a lack of perspective within the legal proceedings and these lawsuits are aimed at silencing voices in issues of public interest. These lawsuits uh, differ from other state actions to criminalize public participation. When, for example, the state uses the judiciary to persecute journalists and other activists. We see that there is a clear imbalance of power. It is economic and political power used against journalists, human rights defenders, and citizens who talk about public issues. The lawsuits are kept within the course forever to silence these people. Officials, politicians, business persons make the most of these lawsuits to silence journalists and other individuals through these long and excessive proceedings. The effects of intimidation and silencing usually are fruitful. There are journalists that face over 100 lawsuits in a single country for the same publication on sexual abuse. This um, lawsuits also are against women who protest for sexual abuse. For example, there are journalists who have faced eight year long legal proceedings. The Inter-American Commission and its rapporteurship cannot delay their response. International organizations have warned about this big threat for the exercise of freedom of expression. In 2022, the UN Human Rights Council called upon states to adopt legislative measures against this phenomenon. The European Commission has discussed a normative package to address this issue in the European Union. The UN rapporteurs have also pronounced about this and recognized the need to adopt measures against this phenomenon. However, there are no initiatives of a similar kind in the Inter-American system. According to the Convention and the Statute of the Commission, the Commission has a duty to develop standards to protect freedom of expression. Taking into consideration the pronouncements of the court, which recognize these losses as a threat, the court considered that these losses is an abuse of judicial mechanisms, and therefore there is a need for state control over these mechanisms. Several states are discussing legislation in the matter, and the courts start to look at the problem, but they don't have the tools that they need. In order to promote this urgent response, now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues who will share their statements and how they see the problem affecting the region.
Rodolfo, ¿podrías? Rodolfo. Would you mind unmuting yourself, please? Bueno, bueno. Ahora sí. Hello. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rodolfo Ruiz. I'm from Mexico. I'm director of a digital media outlet, e consulta. Um, our digital portal is in three states of Mexico, and we suffer pressure like many other media outlets in the region. We suffer different types of insults from by different areas of the states, and also we suffer from um, civil lawsuits, also audits, and also we are facing three criminal proceedings for alleged money laundering and illegal management of resources. Mm, unfortunately, these proceedings occur in other countries such as Guatemala. This judicialization was conducted by Miguel Barbosa together with officials close to him. They just wanted to benefit or to uh, in fact, uh, to um, undermine the role of the digital portal that I lead. And they wanted to stop our investigations into corruption by state officials. These lawsuits have undermined the media outlet that I lead because several journalists, because of this systematic judicialization, decided to quit and to work in other media outlets because they, fe uh, they fear losing their jobs. In 2020, 20 lawsuits were filed and one in 2022. The last lawsuit advanced in a very unusual way. I was sentenced to repair the moral damage that I caused against Amanda Gomez Nava. I would like to read the resolution so you can see the results of the trial and how Puebla's judiciary is not administering justice. This is the statement. Truthfulness is not about true, clear, and certain information. That would um, affect the right to inform interviews, publications, articles should be based on a fair exercise of journalism. And there should be a basis for the facts that are informed. So what they are saying is what I wrote is true or false, but what I wrote should have fit the, dem the demands or the expectations of public officials. 19 um, proceedings were closed, but in the other lawsuits, the judges are not issuing their rulings. This is, for example, the case of one of the magistrates of one of the civil courts my case is similar to other cases of other human rights defenders and journalists in my country. In 2012, Article 19 documented a series of lawsuits and legal proceedings that could be criminal or administrative against communicators and journalists. But also there are uh, different types of censorship and we are being subjected to judicialization processes, threats, and campaigns to undermine our role. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Good Catalina. afternoon. My name is Catalina Ruiz Navarro, director and founder of Volcanics, a regional digital magazine of feminist journalism. Thank you for this space. The case that I'm here to talk about is a case of judicial abuse. 
with a success perspective. In June 2020, Matilda de los Milagros Londonio and I published eight reports of sexual abuse against Ciro Guerra. We follow high standards of journalism. We contrast the sources and we interview the person that is, was being accused. After the article Ciro Guerra, a renowned film director persecuted us traditionally. He presented two remedies against us. He reported us in the criminal jurisdiction and we were summoned to testify. Guerra also filed a civil lawsuit against us for $1 million using the same allegations that we were damaging his reputation. These legal actions could set a precedent of silencing for all girls in Colombia who would like to talk about their experiences of sexual abuse in Colombia. And this is also a threat for all journalists in our country. How we can exercise journalism if the people with, that we investigate want to send us to prison. Also, we have a lot of lawsuits that prevent us from doing our work. Are they going to take us to a judge to regulate our sources? Our case is not the single one. This is the norm of powerful people that call liars or who call those journalists or women who tell their stories that they are liars. El 20, an organization that defends freedom for expression and that promotes the ethical exercise of the of law represented as pro bono and then with the support of other organizations. Many journalists are not lucky enough. Thanks to the defense of El 20, the Constitutional Court issued ruling T452 in 2022, which determined that the interview did not avoid or ignore the constitutional rights of Ciro Guerra. The court concluded that there were elements of judicial harassment and abuse because there was a lack of imbalance or lack of balance. And Guerra resorted to several courts to request some compensation, compensation that we couldn't pay. The court established also that these women just communicated the voices of other women who feel felt unsafe and were not ready to face harassment and abuse. Sir Alfonso Guerra and his colleagues decided to start some judicial actions with disproportionate demands. Three years have gone, gone, have gone by and the legal proceedings have affected our health and have affected our families. And those proceedings are a threat for our stability and integrity in the future. Sexual abuse and harassment against women are a public interest issue and they require urgent conversations in the region. And we need freedom for expression to discuss these matters. Usually the perpetrators are men with a lot of power and they have access to very expensive legal counsel. They use the legal system to persecute journalists and to silence other people who might be presenting complaints. We do not want to replace justice. Legal proceedings are fundamental so that there are spaces so that other women and victims of abuse felt comfortable to share their stories. We want your support so that we are not being silenced. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Paulo Cuenca. I'm from Brazil. Thank you for the possibility of telling you about my country. I was invited by Abraji. I would like to uh, greet you all. My study starts on uh, 
June 20th, 19, 2020, when I said on Twitter, Brazilians will only be free when the uh, last Bolsonaro is uh, hanged from the um, from the innards of the last uh, of the last of the last uh, priest. And this is based on a phrase from Voltaire. And the idea is that men will only be free when the last man is hanged from the in, from the innards of the last priest. Now, the uh, this was a proverb that I, I thought of while I was reading uh, about the funds of the state that of the state that would go to the evangelical uh, church. So the metaphor was. Uh, was an uh, was symbolizing how it was necessary to separate church from state. Uh, minutes after that, I was the uh, target of uh, thousands of accounts from the uh, right in Brazil. And a few hours later, I deleted the tweet. I tried to explain uh, what had happened, but it was too late because this uh, this um, campaign against me. Uh, reached my employers in Germany at Deutsche Welle, I was dismissed from my job. And that was celebrated by uh, neo-fascist congresspersons in Bolsonaro's family. The week later, I received hundreds of death threats and I could never get a job again at the mass, at the media outlets. But that's that was only the beginning because the Bolsonaro's filed reports against me in Rio, Sao Paulo, and Brasilia. Fortunately, the prosecutors who received them rejected them. But a little after that, the Universal Church filed 144 civil sues against me in an action orchestrated through their priests. And they used the same model of lawsuit in a several states in Brazil, in very distant cities, they used a type of free justice that obliges the accused to present themselves at the jurisdiction where the lawsuit is filed. So it was impossible for me to defend myself in all these places. The total amount they asked for was about 2.5 million reais, about half a million dollars. Now, fortunately, I was I received the support of an NGO that is covering my legal expenses and in Rio and San Pablo. But even if I won all 144 processes, the damage is already done. The objective of these proceedings was not victory. They just want to hush any critical voices through journalistic uh, opinions or and they are a symbol a threat and an example to everyone dare not to use our holy name in vain based on my case now there's a civilian an ongoing civilian civil investigation at a federal level and this is trying to investigate legal harassment uh, with the objective of uh, obstaculizing access to justice. And I hope that this won't just bother those who initiated these actions, because so far the use of the abuse of the legal system has uh, been unpunished in our region. But I trust the uh, regulation that will identify these types of repetitive lawsuits and will punish those who use them. It's too much power concentrated. It's a gun pointing at all of us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I see the uh, timer. I, I can't see the timer. How are we on time? Uh, there are still six minutes left, Commissioner. Does anyone else in the civil society wish to speak? Will anyone else be speaking? Yes, my name is Juan Luis Font. Yes, thank you. My name is Juan Luis Font. I'm a journalist from Guatemala. I have been working for 33 years. I've been exiled since September 2020, 2022, but I continue to do my uh, TV and radio shows at a dis uh, uh, remotely. 
uh, now the uh, government of Guatemala is investigating me and has investigated me in four legal proceedings. No charges were filed, but they accused me of money laundering and they have asked a judge illegally to order uh, uh, my arrest that was repealed afterwards. They even reported, they, they sorry, they even denounced my own attorney and they used the testimony of a former minister for communication who was uh, imprisoned for corruption to um, sustain the report against me. And my case is not this, the most serious one, it's just another one, another example of the use of prosecution against journalism in my country. My colleague, Jose Ruben Zamora, the president of a newspaper, is about to, um, is, will be, will soon have uh, spent a year in jail. He has had to change lawyers nine times because four of them were uh, processed criminally and were forced to accept charges for obstruction of justice. Nine reporters of uh, his newspaper are under investigation because of uh, obstruction of justice because they covered the uh, trial against Samora. The newspaper had to close its, its doors because of all these uh, acts of prosecution. I was a director of that media outlet for 17 years. Pressures against the press have uh, muddied the waters in the electoral process and continue to weaken institutions in my country. The most vulnerable journalists, nevertheless, are those located in remote locations, not in the biggest cities in Guatemala. And I'm talking about uh, newspapers who do their work in uh, territories with mining operations, where the, uh, the justice system has been used to um, convince them not to criticize the extractive industries. In many cases, mining companies work with the uh, legal system to restrict or to restrain the work of journalists. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, my name is Raisa Carrillo. I am representing Fundación para la Libertad de, Pres de Prensa in Colombia. We have listened to uh, the, a few examples of slaps in our region and testimonies that show the abuse of the legal system to silence political discourse. Now their objective is clear because they are trying to inhibit journalists from doing their job and from criticizing governments. So on behalf of all the organizations, we urge the commission and the special rapporteurship to recognize the danger of slaps in the region and to agree on measures to face this problem. Once again, we after, there was um, a pronouncement by the court and now the commission and the rapporteurship have an obligation to uh, make a position on this issue as well and to protect freedom of expression. We specifically ask the rapporteurship to draft a thematic report about the uh, impact of this phenomenon, considering the legal and political context in the region. This will allow to see what kind of measures within the legal frameworks are and that are compatible with the inter-American system can be applied, always following due process and the protection of freedom of expression. Having said, after, after that, the rapporteurship will be able to issue recommendations on this subject. We ask the rapporteurship and the commission the cre to create a group of experts to uh, draft standards from a legal standard, from a legal perspective uh, on these public affairs. This group should have the participation of judges, persons affected by the by this type of harassment and representatives of the civil society, the legal community, experts in civil, criminal, procedural and administrative law. In particular, this group should assess the issue in a comprehensive manner to assess the existing legal frameworks uh, and for example, the case of crimes against honor and all the um, 
legislations that do not comply with the human rights standards in the region and also those actions that intend to restrict freedom of expression. Considering all these actions and how urgent this topic is, the civil society announces the creation of a regional group against litigious harassment that will uh, mean a landmark in Latin America. We urge the uh, country reporters and the reporter, special rapporteurship to join this group so that we can all fight this scourge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now uh, the time has run out. We will move on to the participation of my colleagues. So I would like to ask Commissioner Hoel if he wishes to speak. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I um, I will try to keep it short and sweet because the star tonight is Special Rapporteur Pedro Vaca. But I would like to recognize the work of the organizations that have requested this hearing for their participation, for their being here, for the information they are providing with the purpose, as Paulina was saying, I believe, uh, of the uh, commission drafting um, recommendations. You know, the information you have provided is very relevant with regards to the judicialization of journalists. So there are two tasks I will add to my mandate, one of them as Rapporteur for uh, Human Rights Defenders, and I, because I want to record the uh, link between the threats suffered by human rights defenders, because they are uh, this, the patterns are very similar. In many countries, the uh, national mechanisms for protection cover both journalists and defenders. But there's another important task we, uh, or kind of homework we should all uh, take from this. And, and that's, trying to uh, pay more attention to the countries uh, we work with. When we uh, carry out work visits, it's important, for, it's important for us to think of this particular topic. Thanks to the work of the special rapporteurship, it's an element we always take into account. But I think it's very important to keep that in mind. So, so that'll be all uh, for me. Thank you very much, Madam, Pres uh, Ma Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rallon. Yes, thank you, Madam Vice President. I would like to start by thanking the civil society for its work. I think that within the framework of this 187th period of sessions, discussing this issue at a regional uh, hearing is of the utmost importance. And even though there has been some progress in the European system, we are facing a huge challenge in the inter-American system, considering what you've uh, presented today so that we can analyze the information. And of course, we would like to tell the organizations that if you have any kind of complementary information uh, that you can send in written form, that would be wonderful as well. And of course, I suppose the uh, Freedom of Expression Rapporteur will be uh, discussing several aspects here, but I would just like to mention that this topic needs to be addressed with quite a comprehensive outlook because it includes procedural aspects, because many of the voices and reports tell us that sometimes the uh, mechanics for these kinds of labs is having one hundred hundreds of processes, so you can start, you can get stuck in the system, and this goes hand in hand with uh, the independence of the judiciary because that's key to have respect uh, for the due process and to may have a distinction between an apparent. Um, legal action that seeks to silence journalists and a legitimate action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to ask the Executive Secretary if she wishes to speak, and then we will give the floor to uh, Rapporteur Vaca. 
No, uh, I will leave my time to the special rapporteur. Thank you. Rapporteur, Mr. Vaca, Madam President, Commissioner Bernal is here as well. Yes, I just saw him. Just a second. I apologize, Commissioner. I didn't I didn't see you on the screen. I'm sorry. It's okay, Madam President. Thank you very much. I would just like to thank uh, those who requested this hearing and the uh, Executive Secretariat and my colleagues. I have a very specific question. Um, I would like to uh, hear the opinion of those participating. A few months after I arrived at the Commission, one of my first assignments was presenting before the Inter-American Court the case Moja SFV Costa Rica. I was very happy back then because for the first time the Inter-American Court accepted that at least in terms of civil responsibility, there's a the, the standard they adopted is that of the case of uh, New York Times v. Sullivan, meaning the, K, the uh, standard of actual malice. So I would like to know, I would like to know about what you think about that case and the standard uh, mentioned there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Special Rapporteur, Pedro. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to greet the commissioners who are here, the Executive Secretary, and all the organizations that requested this thematic hearing. First of all, I would like to share a reflection. I believe that what the civil society is proposing has to do with um, broken promise of democracy to journalism because the work of journalism of journalism is fundamental in analyzing the public debate and we expect institutions to provide protection warranties not only in terms of uh, having no prior censorship but also then following inter-american standards and many of the situations they have presented are have already been covered by the monitoring work of our special rapporteurship. And of course, we have taken note of their requests. In the Americas, we hope to have an open public debate that contributes to a better understanding of our surroundings. And that has to do with judicial warranties. In our monitoring work, um, after violence, the most common uh, claim has to do with the lack of warranties in a judicial debate about uh, the uh, statements for public interest. As you were mentioning, I'm talking to the civil society, um, through the court, the slap phenomena has already been recognized in the system. So the big question here at this hearing is a question uh, the commission will be bringing to the plenary, right? We need a roadmap to process this these claims to see if there are other mechanisms that can be activated. For example, the development of knowledge uh, because we have been requested to uh, develop a thematic report to issue recommendations or maybe follow up groups. And as I see that the civil society has been creating them, I would also like to use the experience of those here to ask a couple of questions that are, I believe are key questions for the future of the work of our rapporteurship and the commission as a whole. We know that freedom of expression is a right about that sometimes has limits. And we uh, actually always uh, make requests so that there is freedom of expression in the legal system as well, so that the press can defend itself. So I would like to ask those participating here, maybe you can tell us now, or you can send this uh, in written form, but what's the difference between a legitimate claim for uh, the restriction 
of uh, freedom of expression and these abuses of the judiciary when trying to censor the public debate based on your experience is it about the volume is it the topic the passive subject what the um journalistic uh work i think these are elements that will be important so that the inter-american system can analyze these a uh, topic that has several uh, aspects that must be taken into account. And can you also share good practices or best practices at a regional level or a state level? Uh, you mentioned the early stages of the processes and maybe best practices. There Are, are there any best practices where the judiciary, as soon as it received the uh, claim, decided to uh, do an analysis on the impact of the lawsuit. When can we identify these best practices? Because we have heard here that regardless of the result of the litigation, they are so lengthy in time and the public exposure, the finger pointing, um, um, the uh, legal suspense is already having an effect that can uh, affect the journalists. No one wants to go under a legal process if they consider that they are participating of a democracy in a legitimate manner. Of course, this takes a, a, a toll on families, on uh, press rooms, and we could even say that this and may even affect the confidence of others in the public debate. And that's my, my next question. Do you believe in the different examples you've given us that the uh, legal proceeding has uh, inhibited the uh, public debate on the issue that was uh, being discussed? Uh, on the litigation, I'm talking about the chilling effect, which is something that the inter-American system has been addressing for some time. And if I may, Madam President, I would also like to ask about some maybe topics that are particularly uh, likely to be uh, litigated about. Uh, I would like to refer to topics that are very relevant to the commission, like the uh, denouncing of expressions that uh, mention violence against women. For example, this is something that maybe would call for some specific type of address. The inter-American system has talked about uh, these courses that are, that are specifically protected. So the restraints on uh, freedom of expression should be even stricter political discourse, uh, identity discourse, in public affairs, types of discourse that show violence against women. Should they be part of that category? And what would be the elements to consider that? And finally, and I will be wrapping up with this, I would like to mention a couple of joint declarations of our rapporteurship, in particular, the uh, joint declaration from 2022, when we proposed a conversation with the community to widen the category of discourses that have a specific protection because there are other contextual elements. And so, we expected to uh, have overcome this by 2023, but they are fundamental as it is shown by this conversation. For example, tolerance to criticism for actors who have willingly exposed themselves to social attention because that tolerance is lower and lower. And Another element that the commission has found concerning in its annual reports are the conditions of the independence of the judiciary and the uh, strength of the rule of law. I thank you for this space. We have taken note of uh, all your requests and if the commission wishes 
uh, for this. We could include this to the work of our rapporteurship. Thank you very much, dear organizations, for your work, because sometimes your work uh, sometimes ends up making up for a lack of work in countries. There are many attorneys who dare not represent journalists because of the threats they may suffer. Fortunately enough, there are civil society organizations that are uh, covering for them and that they are supporting journalists. And I would like to acknowledge that. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Pedro. I knew you would be prepared to answer about all this. Maria Claudia has raised her hand. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I just want to support what uh, the Commission and the Special Rapporteur has said. When we monitor the situation of human rights in the region, the Commission has always noted the phenomenon of criminalization of journalists, human rights defenders, and justice operators. That's why in the annual report of the Commission in Chapter 4A, uh, which is about the landscape uh, and the situation of human rights. We look at the situation in every country across the region and in chapter 4B um, in the countries included in that chapter, we analyze article 59 of the rules of procedure of the commission and the commission took into consideration these elements and this growing phenomenon that is the use of the judicial system to manipulate and silence opposing dissident voices, as well as the voices that advocate for rights and journalists. So that would be all on my end. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I only have one comment to make for um, the organizations. I truly thank them for all the information that they have shared with us. And we hope we can receive the information that has been requested to establish this communication between you and the Office of the Special Rapporteur and how the work of the regional group um, could also be followed by the Inter-American Commission. The right that is at risk is the right to freedom for express of expression and the right to access to information. And this violation of the right to a fair trial and to judicial guarantees is key because the judiciary is a key actor because it is the means to silence journalists and all those who work in media outlet. So I would like to know what you think that the elements that should be addressed are what elements should be identified according to you? What are the elements within this response of the judiciary that goes against judicial independence? So we know that the judiciary or the judicial system needs to address 140 lawsuits. And that's a chaotic situation, especially for the person that is being sued. 
but it's also a challenge for the system itself. So I would like to know what elements you believe should be addressed in order to ensure traditional independence. Uh, when I was talking about my personal experience, I was thinking about the need to train justice operators on what protecting the right to freedom of expression and access to information implies. Pedro was talking about the need to protect public speech and the limits that exist. So if there is a legitimate complaint, there could be a legitimate response because what we need are effective responses, not responses that are aimed at silencing or intimidating people. So the commission takes note of all these commitments. I think that joint press releases and statements are key and should be explored. Now, We have, uh, I don't remember the time. The civil society will have 22 minutes now to react to the intervention of the commission. Is that right? So I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the civil society to listen to their reactions. Thanks to the Commission for this space, for the special rapporteur for his questions. I want to be very brief. Since 2020, we have been studying um, the characteristics of the judiciary because access to justice is one of the most important elements of the rule of law. But it's important to determine when access to justice is abusive and is for censorship aims. Sometimes there could be a conflict regarding freedom of expression. If something that has been said could have been said. Secondly, it's important to see if the case appears in a prima facie study. Uh, there could be a prima facie study to determine that the case is unfounded. Because it's important that the proceeding is only used to determine whether the truth is the aim. So it's necessary to conduct what the case implies. So this is what we propose. Uh, the commission should study the procedural law of each country to see if this is prima facie study could be done before starting with a legal proceeding. In many cases, there is a lot of imbalances between the two parties. And usually the sector that intimidates has resources, has access to power spaces, and therefore that facilitates access to justice. And also we see that the aim is to silence uh, people for matters of public interest. Um, in many of the cases, 
Many of the cases of violence seem to be long to the private sphere, but are also a matter of public interest. Also for El 20, we need to present two conclusions about what we do. This conversation will be serious if we invite the judiciary to participate because this is not about judicial harassment. And what we see is that these lawsuits that are intimidated are from those operators and judges that use the system to censor and intimidate people. Also, in an institutional landscape uh, like the one in Latin America where the system sometimes are badly administered, we believe that the system should focus on urgent cases. And we need to invite associations of lawyers, the civil society, and also we need to invite those people who develop procedural laws and rules so that they reform the system to guarantee better protection for freedom of expression so that the judges are not vehicles of censorship. So that's the idea that we wanted to present. We want inter-American standards to be respected. We believe that we have enough indicia for the need to have reforms in procedural law and systems through which people access to the judiciary. And therefore, we believe that law professionals should be included in this conversation. Thank you. Hello, how are you? My name is Paula Rom Moreno Roman. Thank you for your time. I'm here on behalf of the Argentine Forum of Journalists I will also talk about uh, the regional landscape. We agree with Abrashi colleagues. In our country, there were 24 lawsuits against journalists. And some of those cases are considered cases of intimidation against journalists. In general, the sectors that promote these measures to silence and to prevent the visibility of public matters are those who come from the public sphere and from areas with a lot of power. Slaps are an abusive form of abuse of the judicial system that goes beyond national courts because there is no legislation to prevent or sanction those practices. And because judges are not trained on this, Therefore, we need regional practices. As we heard during this hearing, these legal proceedings affect the right to defense of journalists, apart from violations to freedom of expression. This is the result of the imbalance that exists. And we have a scenario of silencing and intimidation. There are several forms of power that are used for this economic power, political power, judicial power, and also the power of agents that distribute articulated serial lawsuits. In Argentina, after the case of Kime, uh, the type of libel and slander is no longer considered as a possibility for crimes against honor. The Inter-American Court in 20, 2008 condemned the state of Argentina for violating freedom of expression, especially when statements are just an opinion regarding a public official. But there are other methods to intimidate people, for example, civil lawsuits or alternative types of crime like illicit or illegal associations. We have cases such as Enzo, Santoro, Benito, and there are other cases that sum up across the country. So those who pretend to silence people 
usually use the civil legal pathway to do that. It's important that the Secretariat of Human Rights prepares a report on slap cases because these slaps are an attack against democracy. They prevent the press from informing what public officials are doing. So we need to improve or to have more requirements for the filing of lawsuits. Also in Argentina, there is no in limine rejections of this type of situations. In Brazil, there are also other strategies that are used to uh, hamper the work of journalists, such as serial lawsuits that threaten journalists and lawyers that erode the exercise of journalism. Uh, the person that is sued um, usually suffers from the fact that the person that files the complaint presents a complaint or the lawsuit in the court or before the court that will be more effective for them. Although local courts understand and advocate for freedom of expression, silence and intimidation occur before reaching the court. And also there is a lack of, this leads to a lack of information. The civil society and media outlets and journalists are advancing to create and build spaces of discussion to discuss some bills and the strategies to create bill positive jurisprudence. But also we need to call up on states to build, prepare public policies in this regard. This is not just isolated cases or individual cases. This is a regional trend and it demands a solution that is specialized. Thank you. I would like to answer some of the questions presented by the commissioners and the special rapporteur. I would like to talk about the best practices that we have identified in other regions or countries. Together with Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, this is an academic center that researches and publishes best practices and case law in different countries in terms of freedom of expression. We have identified some trends that exist in some countries to see how the courts react to these cases when there is no special legislation or anti-slap legislation. Canada, Australia, the United States have anti-slap anti legislation and they have had them for over 20 years, but they have a common law system that is not the same as our Latin American systems, but there are legal elements that could be used to explore or to improve our procedural law in South Africa, India, Bulgaria, and Colombia, they use these rules about the abuse of law and there are different, different procedural types that are being used. And uh, the sued parties should present these arguments before the courts. The courts are facing these cases in different jurisdictions and they are expanding their interpretation regarding the scope and the enforcement of these rules. And they are trying to improve their jurisprudence and they need that they understand these tools. They have these rules, but at the same time, they understand that they don't have sufficient tools and there should be a special legislation in order to conduct this prima facie study this is a practice that is a trend in several countries and the proposal of the European Union considers these elements. It talks about uh, an unbased or unreasonable lawsuit. 
So there are several elements and analysis that the courts conducted in these cases. And within the Latin American context, these losses are not only civil. Sometimes these losses are related to intellectual property and other or intellectual property demand, uh, lawsuits. So we need to look at those bodies that study cases and we need to look uh, not only at the possibility of having cases that are unfounded or un unreasonable, but also there are courts that look at the motive and the behavior of the complainant. Uh, they look at different elements, for example, if different legal uh, mechanisms were used to fight the loss of, if they're using different remedies or actions to delay the proceeding, if the arguments lack, uh, the arguments like lack a basis or a foundation. So there are many, many best practices that can be shared and that could be a good guideline for the commission and for the Office of the Special Rapporteur. With regard to the question asked by Commissioner Bernal, we have identified that many courts look at these cases and sometimes they do not recognize these cases as strategic lawsuits, but they use uh, this concept of uh, real malice. And usually these cases end up resulting in favor for freedom of expression. One of the obstacles that we can see in this argument is that these results uh, occur when the effects of the legal proceeding um, have been effective. People are already silenced and intimidated. But this is a standard that is being used when uh, the courts examine the merits of the case, of the cases. And therefore, it, this standard does not prevent a legal proceeding from being long and expensive. And also, it's important to say that there are several countries across the region that are trying to regulate the issue, but they lack guidance. El 20 promoted a procedure in Colombia. We know that in Panama, there is a bill and the civil society has been invited to participate and there could be a counterproductive effect. In Peru, they have recognized that there are several lawsuits of this type, but the legislative power is putting barriers So we see that there is a trend to amend the criminal legislation in terms of libel and slander, and they want to modify the legislation to put more barriers while there are other legislation that is more positive. Thank you. Hola. Sí. Uh, how are we doing on time? Paola. Five more minutes. Okay. Hi, thank you for uh, listening to me. I am Paola Ogas. I'm a journalist since 1999. I'm from Lima. I have two children. Commissioner, yeah, it's five more minutes. Okay, go on, Paula. Since 2010, I am part of a Catholic organization called Soalicio. And in 2015, along with 
Pedro Salinas, we published a book about the abuses against the organization of these members. Then I started investigating their financial moves and I exposed how through their companies, they used the Concordato, an agreement signed between Peru and Vatican City. In 2008, they started an operation to uh, ruin my journalistic reputation, to threaten me. They tried to expose my lobby, my loved ones. They tried to um, scare those who hire me. And finally, they tried to prosecute me at the judiciary. In 2008, the Archbishop of Pura denounced me and my colleague, Pedro Salida, for a uh, Different for libel in a city where we don't live. He forced us to go to the north of the country where and, and face a trial where he is part of the factual powers. And just to give you an example on the uh, judicial, the the headquarters of the judiciary of the judiciary, there is a chapel. My colleague was convicted for libel back in April, and I was presented my testimony as a witness. Thanks to a team sent from Vatican City, Archbishop Lenguren was told that if he wanted to um, prosecute uh, journalists, uh, he had to um, he, they ha he had to ask for a uh, leave of absence. At the moment, that at that moment, he uh, dropped the lawsuits against us, but a lawsuit against me was opened for false testimony. Ever since, the so, so Alicia was out of the picture, but then another team was in and they started to uh, present lawsuits against me. And in 2009, I was be a journalist with the highest amount of lawsuits against her in my country. They started to create an ecosystem to uh, attack me and Pedro Salinas. What did they do? Well, they mixed the work we did between uh, the book I did between 2013 and 2014 as a community manager for the current mayor back then. And they said, as part of this uh, defamation campaign, they said that I am a co-mayor and that I had powers to order gigantic uh, works with multi-million budgets. They said that I traveled to Panama with the mayor, that she gave me bags of money, that I took a bus to Salvador. I gave a bag of money to journalist Gustavo Goriti and then came back to Lima. And then six years later, in March 2020, I spent everything on a network led by me and I gave them $100,000 to them. They also said that I purchased a car from a friend in Sinaloa and that with the uh, rest of the money, my colleague Pedro Salinas and I uh, traffic lands in the south of Lina. And they also said that I want the uh, Ciudadalicio to leave Pura because I'm in cahoots with uh, the daughter of a journalist who has an agreement to uh, with a um, mass media outlet in uh, the Middle East, in Al Jazeera. Uh, that sounds surreal, isn't it? Yes, but everything was published in the Expresso in 2020. And back then, the evidence they presented were um, chats they drafted on Microsoft Word. One, uh, the, the report was filed by a journalist uh who you who worked since the 1990s uh we asked for him to present testimony but he has disappeared the entire ecosystem against me is linked to the current mayor of lima who is a person that before he was a politician was a businessman and he is a uh he is a partner of the solar radio so Alizio and his former candidates to Congress are 
a consistent part of the defamation campaign against me. They have filed reports against me and they have used uh, portables asking for my detention or to uh, prevent me from leaving the country. And it is because of all of this that there are two investigations uh, against me for money laundering and corruption. I am part of the Lava Hato case, as if I was a former president or an elected official. I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. Okay. The commissioner was uh, telling us that we need to wrap up. Yes, I'm sorry, we have a, another hearing. It's okay, thank you. I am really sorry. I'm really sorry to do that, but this is very important information, very valuable information, and I think it is necessary. I, I just wanted to, to wrap up saying that uh, I have a lawsuit against me for in, for illegal enriching, uh, one for money laundering, and now they are assessing a preemptive uh, prison against me, and they are trying to prevent me from leaving the country. Yes, I understand. It's very concerning. I mean, the situation you all are going through, considering these exp experiences you have shared, and for the commission, it is very important to receive all this information because it also allows us, not only with the uh, RELE, the Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression, but also because of uh, all the monitoring work we do of the different situations and circumstances, the rights of human rights defenders, or in this case, journalists are affected in their la daily labor. So thank you very much for uh, all the information you've presented. If you uh, believe we should have more information, we would appreciate it if you could send it to us so that we can work with on them together with you. Thank you very much. And we will uh, continue with this commitment to work together. Thank you very Perdón, much, Madam Comisar. Commissioner. Uh, we will take a picture. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, that's my technical support assisting me. Si todos mirar la cámara, por favor. Please, could you all look at the camera? Estamos. Muchas gracias. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Mucho gusto. Hasta luego. Todos gracias. gracias.